Hi, everyone, and welcome to day two of Adobe Live. I am your host, Anna McNaught, and I am joined today again by Eric Almez. He is an incredible photographer and Photoshop compositor. Welcome, Eric. I'm so happy to have you here again today. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Of and course. Thanks for the compliments. Yeah, yeah, your work is phenomenal. And welcome everyone to the chat. Thank you for being here with us again. Hello, Fairy. Hello, Sean. Hello, Cody Bear, Carol. Let us know where you all are chatting in from today. And uh, and we are going to be having an open conversation with Eric because he is just full of knowledge. As we learned yesterday, he has so much to share with us. So today, if you have any questions for him, be sure to drop them in the chat and come over to behance.net slash adobe live so you can join in on the conversation eric without further ado let's dive right into you <laughs> <laughs> nice little oh, rhyme thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay you sent me off the ski jump i'm ready to go um, thank you uh so let me see so where do we start? So this is kind of a continuation of yesterday. So I'm not going to go through the same stuff, but in short, I'm a photographer that grew up in Norway. I came to the US to study and spent now half my life in the US working as a commercial photographer. So if you didn't see yesterday's, um, that's the quick rundown of who I am. Um, yesterday, we touched a little bit on um, the things that happens prior to sitting down on the computer to do a composite. And we touched on inspiration for a second. So today I prepared a few little things to speak to that, to maybe help someone um, find inspiration because it's awesome. a pretty fascinating topic, right? And I got some opinions about it. So um, I'll just dive uh, right in. Um, I put on this slide, creativity. It's something that happens or sometimes come to us. And if you just assume that we're going to walk around and be inspired one day, right? And people ask me, where do I get inspired and how do I get inspired? It's not so much where and how, it's about allowing it to happen. And what I found with myself, I'm not going to talk too much. Maybe I should give a picture so that we have something to look at. <laughs> um, so what often happens to me, I find these days, is that when I have an empty space in my day, where stuff would sort of bubble up and I would listen to my internal dialogue and be inspired, I pick up the phone instead. So the phone has actually taken away a lot of those moments where I used to be creative. So when I wrote on this slide, um, let it happen, it means be quiet for a minute. Don't allow um, yourself to fill your time with something constantly. I think the two times now I'm inspired really is in the shower and when I run, right? Because that's the times when I don't have the phone. I don't automatically pick it up to just fill my time if I'm waiting for something or about to do something. So my biggest thing is to put the phone away and allow yourself just to be and to listen and stuff will happen for sure. Um, one of my recent pieces, quickly, three things to help with inspiration. Is this useful, by the way? Yes. I think this is awesome. You Very know. useful. I, I, I think you nailed it on the head by saying that like we always pick up our phones when we're in this moment of boredom. And uh, and when you let yourself be quiet for a few minutes, that is when creativity comes. So this is definitely useful. Very helpful information. I think everyone knows this, but to be aware of it and think about it for a minute, you know this is the truth, right? And by being aware of it, you will allow it to happen a little bit more frequent, hopefully. Now, that might not help a lot, right? By saying, oh, don't look at your phone. Now be creative. Um, it's not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I would put down three things to help before we get into how this helped me for this next picture we're gonna do today. Perfect. I mean, I know this is a retouch thing, but if I were to share something, it's not the about the practical things. Um, I got to share this quote. There's this guy, Dave Sivers. I don't know if you know him, but I know him through the Tim Ferriss podcast. He's been mm. on there a couple of times. And he said on there that if it was about information, everyone would be super skinny, have six packs and be millionaires. Because the information is out there and we all know really how to do it and find this information, right? The thing is, is that we don't do it. Right. So... I just want to give some practical tools so that you can actually go and be a creative rather than just 
talking about it. Um, three things to help. One is find a place or picture you're drawn to. Uh, close your eyes and ask yourself what happened here yesterday. Who was here? What did they do? Was I there? Who did I meet? And just with those simple questions, right? The mind start working and you start seeing things. So if you come to a cool place, if let's say you're in a new city and you go to Brooklyn, there's textures everywhere with brick buildings and there's some history there for sure. And then you just start thinking, oh, what happened here yesterday? And something will come to you. You will see characters, you will see narratives, you will see stories. Uh, or you could even do this with a photograph, just an old picture, for instance, of a landscape. And then ask yourself, what happened here 50 years ago, 30 years ago? What happened here yesterday? What will happen here tomorrow? And suddenly you will start, your mind will start spinning narratives. That is so easy to photograph. I love that. That's a little bit of a hack. And I put this picture in here. We're going to talk about this afterwards. This is a landscape. Uh, this is in Bishop, California, and I've been driving through her so many times and always loved, uh, it's along 395, and always loved this stretch of road. And uh, at one point I went there and shot a background, and then we shot some other pieces to fit in. And I'm going to use this as an example afterwards to how perspectives fit in when you shoot um, composite pieces. Second thing, read poems. You don't have to read a book. You could read a one-minute poem. Take five minutes to read a poem. What do you see when you read it? What visuals does it conjure? Poems are written to express what can't quite be expressed. Photograph what you see and feel when you read a poem. And I love this stuff. Yeah. Um, when the pandemic happened, my wife is an actress. And when the pandemic happened, um, we wanted to create something together and we started looking at stories and narratives. And one of the things we looked at was poetry, like mm -hmm. short story poetry and how we could maybe just do a short story around that. And it's super inspiring. And um, I think words are easier because you look as visual people, we look at pictures all day long and that's always derivative of something else. But if you read a poem or read words, it will be a hodgepodge of all these things that you yourself have seen or experienced, and you will express that in a very original manner. So, Love that. Do you have uh, a favorite poem? You know, I have collections of poems. Maybe The Raven, Edgar okay. Allan Poe. Yeah. Um, I used to recite it by heart. There's a few Shakespeare things. When I was younger, I prided myself on reciting poems here and there wow uh, that's super cool not gonna do that here though so <laughs> let me see. Uh, a third thing and this came from an artist friend of mine from norway and she said she always started with her longings and that's pretty fascinating right if you just give it a minute to ponder what you long for i mean that's a well of inspiration right there absolutely yeah is it connection with who uh, where does that happen what is your dream experience what's your bucket list all these things right man just take the camera there and take pictures of those things um so that's my intro spiel today yeah yesterday awesome. it was about all the stuff that could help you find your voice and um, in that we talked about inspiration and uh uh, that's what I have. Three tips to be inspired. Great. I write a Thank blog. You for sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, it's how those things go. So back to why we're here, which is um, compositing. So sorry for taking you guys down the rabbit hole of inspiration, but I feel this is again almost more important than the information on practical retouch. Yeah. I know that's where we start. We're all interested in cameras and practical parts, but it really is the stuff that comes before that, um, that sets the tone and the journey for the pictures you take. So that's why I'm so um, almost excited to put that in there, even though you guys tuning in is probably here for the composite part, which we are starting now. Yeah. 
I think it's such a huge part of everything as we talked about yesterday. And as Paul Tranny mentioned, you know, you can easily just throw a whole bunch of things onto a canvas, but if there's no inspiration and story behind it and purpose and meaning and deeper connection, then what do you have? And I think you, you explained that so well yesterday. So everyone go watch the replay if you missed it. <laughs> uh, that is so was, was that in the chat? It's so well said. And I'll tell you this, if you're uninspired in the subject matter or the thing you want to create, you're just going to find resistance and you're just going to go, oh, I'm uninspired. Oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, I don't want to do it. But if you find that thing in the picture that you want to explore or feel inspired by, then there's nothing stopping you. You're going to get into yeah. flow. You're going to get into the zone and you're not going to end until that thing is done. So I so, so, so agree. Uh, this is the landscape that I showed earlier. So this is what we captured in Bishop. Then this is an older picture of mine. And this is the composite piece we captured at the time. Um, mm. And the reason I bring this up is that the way I would like to teach compositing, right, is to teach it the proper way, saying, you go to a landscape, you imagine where the story is unfolding, tape measure from the, where the camera is to where the story is unfolding. You have that distance measurement, measure the height of your camera, you have that measurement, know what lens you're shooting with. And then when you do your, and then obviously where the light is, here it's to the right on the frame, pretty low to the horizon. And with those elements, right, it's so easy to do a composite. You set up your camera, you measure the distance to the talent, you shoot with the same lens, and then set up the light and then every single piece should fall perfectly together. Like this picture here. And yeah. this was following this process. So yesterday, right, when I initially thought about this presentation, I thought I would do a signature piece of mine so people can see how it's done. And then I thought I would do a new one so that I started fresh and people can kind of see the process of me approaching a picture and trying to create something. I realized yesterday it wasn't the best idea, right? Because I thought, oh, <laughs> that might take a long time. <laughs> so I started preparing and then realized that the picture that I'd chosen to photograph didn't quite follow these guidelines. Um, so as soon as you know the rules right, you can break them and composite photography can be pretty forgiving. And you will see that in a second. So that's why I wanted to take you through this exercise first. So you know what the right thing is and how to do it seamlessly which I really pride myself on in all my advertising work, to be the guy that can put things together without you knowing that it was. So um, let me see. We're going to take away the original talent and we're going to put in my wife. <coughs> and let me see. Maybe I should just turn all these off for now. question um, from the chat for you. Um, uh, how does he start? Better to say, what does he recommend? Learning by doing or attending courses or both? Well, it has to be both. Well, it doesn't yeah. have to be. You could learn by doing for sure without taking classes. But if you take classes and listen to courses, you'll get to where you want to be so much faster. So why wouldn't so you, right? True. There's so much free information, including this. So if you're curious about this is what I would suggest. Find yourself someone that um, whose work you're attracted to, whose work you like. And if they are in the educational space, uh, which a lot of people are these days, just start following them and see what their techniques are. And that will allow you to get to where you want to be pretty quick. Um, I will almost start with exercises from yesterday so you can define to yourself what kind of photography you want to create. That would help you on that journey too. Um, what I don't recommend is to only take classes because if you only take classes, you're not taking pictures, you're not practicing. Right. And it's, I'll tell you this. When I started doing films, I thought, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's just a series of still pictures. It's pretty easy. So you come into it thinking, yeah, I could do it, but not at all. It takes a lot of practice to be fluent, even if it's just other nuances, right? So you have to practice. You can't sit in the classroom and then think you know what to do next. Unless you're doing math or something that's really practical, but not for art. You have to practice that thing, right? Um, 
there's always a gap and there's a name for this. I think it came out of Stanford. There's a gap between where you are and where you want to be. And mm. if that gap becomes too great, you're um, often intimidated by approaching the subject matter or approaching the task and you don't even start. So they say often going into, some, into something pretty naively will help you because you don't realize how big that gap is, right? Right. Anyway, that was a tangent. Uh, you have to do both, I think. Yeah. If you do just practice, you're not going to go where, where you want to be fast enough. You know, it will be a long journey for you, which is fine. But when there's so much free information, just take advantage of it. I totally agree. So let me see. All right. Good questions. And again, if there's, I'd love for this to be a conversation. It's way more fun responding to things than me just yapping away, right? So, yeah. Uh, so this is the background. And I photographed Andrea with the measurements. Uh, both right and wrong um, so that we could see what things look like. So um, let me see. Uh, Maybe this is not the best example to start with. Um, That's the right one. Let me start with the one that's obviously off. All right. So... um, I photographed her too high to low with a lens that was too wide. And then I flopped her to see the light. So the light is correct. And then you look at this, you can say, oh, no, it looks kind of fine. But I'm going to show you something here real quick. I'm going to take off my layer mask. And that's how she really is. So when you do composite, you usually line up the horizon line, right? That's where she should be. At that place, if I'd follow the guidelines, she would stand right here roughly but my camera angle is obviously way too low and she would be way up here and this will kind of work but not really does that make sense yeah so if you look at this you would say oh it looks fine but not really it looks kind of awkward so that's with the camera being way too low too high and it's subtle, right? You see the shoulders, you see the top of the head is different. Yeah. Again, you could say it's maybe okay, but we disable our layer mask. Oh, that's the wrong one. We disable our layer mask. And if I were to follow the perspectives here, lining up the horizon line, she, she would fall right there in the picture. Is this helpful? Very helpful. It, and it actually is kind of uh, answering a question that was in the chat. Um, that fairy asked about measuring the distance and angles of the camera to the model so that it matches. And I think that's exactly what we're kind of doing here is figuring out whether it's eyeballing or measuring. Yeah. So I eyeballed it for the picture you're going to do this afternoon. And I thought it's not the best way to teach. That's why I did this exercise so that we can really see what the right way to do things are. Uh, And then as soon as we know the, the rules, we could break them pretty easily. And I guess you could kind of maybe massage this, right? If I master perfectly, soften the highlight a bit, and match this up a little better, you could maybe get away with it because it is fairly forgiving with a tool like Photoshop. But again, if I take away the horizon line, you could just see how far off um, this picture really is. She should be standing right here if it was to be correct. Okay. Um, So this is obviously very exaggerated, but when you shoot something with a 50 millimeter lens, or that's a normal, or a super wide or a long lens, there will be a different sense of compression, right, within the frame. So if I were to photograph Andrea um, closer to camera, but with a wider lens, so I see the same landscape, but proportionally she is closer because I'm shooting with a wider lens, Mm. there will be a distortion to her, that's very obvious. And this is maybe where most people go wrong, where you take the picture of someone that's photographed with a wide angle or a car. If you shoot a car that's close to camera with a wide angle lens and then try to place the car further in the back of the picture, it will look really awkward really quick because something that's further away won't have the distortion of something that's really close. So that's why you can even see it in her face here. If I were to put this head on Andrea here, you would know that something is off in the composite. So that's the lens part. Um, 
this is the one that's right. So if I undo this, I cheated it a tiny bit, but roughly there's the horizon line lining up. Oh, so yes. that's the right perspective. So when I go in and have this landscape, this was photographed with the original one in mind where I was having first a few feet elevation on the train tracks and then a few feet elevation of the uh, of the cart. So when I went here to shoot this, I had all this in mind. So I stood on the ladder to take this back plate. So it doesn't look that flattering, obviously, for a talent like this. Um, but it was done with the intention of layering in this talent, which has maybe it was one foot here, two foot here. So she stands a lot higher. Mm. But perspective wise, this is the way to approach it, where you measure and use the same um, cameras. Softer light here, she's better lit. If I were to photograph Andrea properly here, I would put a silk in front on her um, sunny side to soften this light and this wrap around her to be more similar to this, which is more correct to the light. But for illustrative purposes for today, I thought this would do it to show the point of how we use measurements to make parts and pieces fit pretty seamlessly. It's so interesting. And your understanding of light and just to know that you would diffuse the light there to make it more accurate is so interesting. And it really shows that you've had years of experience and years of photographing in the natural world to understand how those things interact. And one of the things I've noticed that's so important is studying how light hits subjects and objects and looking at it through the camera. And you clearly have such a strong understanding of that. Um, thank you. I've been at it for 20 some years now. Wow. It's been a while. Yeah. That's awesome. But it's fairly easy to see. And we could talk about that maybe too, because it is a big part of compositing and also uh, both in the way we shoot things, but also the way we mask things. So it's often easy to just make a crisp mask, right? But not, uh, not all edges are equal. A soft light edge often has a little bleed to it. So the light bleeds around on fabric and people. Um, so for those, I'll always use a feathered, softer uh, mask versus a crisp, hard one. Mm. So for here, right, softer highlight, softer edge and softer mask. Here it's crisp, so a crisper outline. Um, so that's the masking part of it. And then there's the lighting part. And um, you have to be a student of light if you want to be a great photographer. Yeah. It's... Um, Again, start with that exercise, you know, figure out what light you're drawn to and what light qualities you like, and then you could figure out how to shape that. Then you could apply that to almost anything. Um, and as you get into artificial light and start using strobes, you could then figure out what strobes and what tools and what modifiers help you achieve that light that you're looking for. Could you zoom in actually on your masks on the difference between um, the soft light and the hard light, just so everyone can kind of see a difference there? Yeah. Well, so don't judge me on these masks here. <laughs> That's um, okay. <laughs> so here there's a super crisp highlight, which is innate in the way this um, the light hits her, right? It's super crisp. Uh, I got some masking issues here. See this over his head? Didn't oh, even yeah. see that earlier. Um, I gotta take that away. But here you would see the edges are definitely softer mm. than what we have on Andrea. I can maybe move her over too. Hey, come on. Maybe this wasn't the best example, but it kind of is, kind of works. Yeah. You see the light yeah. is a lot harder, edges should be crisper. And here you see I missed part of it and you see how harsh the original edge is versus this. Yeah. Um, it's softer. Yeah, that's really interesting to see the difference and to use a, a harder brush with sharper light and then a softer brush when the light is a little bit more diffused absolutely so i would probably do something like this on this and then uh, for all commercial work we go in pixel by pixel so the the level of it's probably right in here right that's how we wow yeah let me see here 
now that edge feels a lot better. All right. Uh, oh, so cool. So that's how it should be done. And uh, now I could put Andrea right up here and she kind of has the same height as the talent. So we see that even though she feels a little small down here, this is kind of the right, right perspective and light for her and size. Did that help? Yeah. Any questions? That's, let us know if you all have any questions based on this. That was extremely informative. Thank you for showing all of that. All right. My pleasure. I'm like mesmerized. I'm like, wow, I have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Huh? I look at my old files at times and I go, oh my God, I was really sloppy. But yeah. It's not so much sloppy. It's really just an understanding of how the composite pieces work so totally um so yeah if that helped i'm super glad oh i could talk to this as well so when i photographed andrea i stuck her in grass this grass didn't quite match but i feel it's important and we talked about this yesterday to do what i call a um, match to source composite mm. so let me just open this up real quick here she is I disabled the layer mask. So I photographed her in this field with the grass to sort of match this grass. So if I photographed her in studio, right, I would need to paint in the shadow. I would need to, for now here, I would just maybe retouch some of these bigger grasses out. But here I would use this stuff to my advantage and blend the grounds in together rather than uh, masking out the feet and trying to make a shadow. If the shadow is organic, the composite is going to feel so much better because then she's anchored in the space. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So that's too yes. wide. Let me see the one that's right. This one is right. Um, so here I would probably, I just did this real quick yesterday, but why am I not uh, there? I'd probably do something like this. Oh, yeah. And then now there's sun on her legs, which we lost on the ground here because the sun is not hitting all the way. It's hitting the top of the grass, but not really at her legs. I would still then either tone this down. Should I do this right now? Is that, yeah. is that informative? Yeah, that would probably be great. Do, probably do something like this. Okay, so what happened there was that I went into my quick mask. I just drew it real quick. I then go out of quick mask, which gave me a selection. Um, I will invert that selection. So that command shift I, now I've only selected that area. And there's many ways to do that, right? You could use any tool to select this area with the grass. I always use curves. So again, a lot of ways to do it, but now I have a curve layer that's masked in that grass. I hover between the two layers to attach this curve so it only affects the layer with Andrea. Then I pull down my highlight. And as I pull down my highlight, this is going to start matching up. Now it feels a little bit too um, heavy in the blacks. So we're going to erase the blacks. And as I do this, we're going to start seeing that the light qualities mm -hmm. between the original and where Andrea is standing is going to start taking shape. Um, feels a little too saturated for me between the two. So this is how it goes when I do composites. It's all about trying to match what was there and what we're adding in. So, all right, so that's close. Maybe it feels a little greener, um, flat, maybe it's yellow. So I would go in to my curves, come into the yellow layer, and I would just pull down the top of the blue. So when there's some color theory here and they could talk about this uh, for days, but essentially <laughs> if I want to add the yellow, I go into the blue layer and I pull it down. That will give tons of blue to my uh, yellow, sorry, to the picture. And if I pull it up, that will give me blue. So when I know that I want yellow, it's all about finding. Um, there we go. So now that I'm close, close enough to contrast is still. Maybe I'll lift this up. Um, so now the tones are close enough, I think. I would um, start blending this together. Maybe keep some 
not the others. And now it's obvious that I'm too bright here in the highlights. It's looking so close. What's important for me here is that I keep the, um, the shadows, right? The shadows is what really anchors any composite piece into the background. If you don't have a shadow, the eye will immediately call um, fake on it because it's not really anchored in the gravity, whatever that is. So anyway, that looks decent, looks better than it was at least. So um, the takeaway, I guess, from, from this would be um, match the source uh, in the composite pieces. And that is both in lighting and in, in, in ground that you're standing on. I showed you guys this picture yesterday of a cowboy on the moon. And I don't know if you remember, but we built the moon surface in my carport at my house. So it wasn't just to shoot him on white. White reflects light differently. Yes, it allows you to mask pretty easy, but it does not quite have, um, it just doesn't feel the same, right? If you have a dark moon surface, it's gonna reflect light very differently than a white canvas. Right. So we had a blue screen in the back and we built the match to source environment on the ground. So that would be an easy composite. Would it be easy for you to bring that picture up real quick so everyone could see it again that may have missed it yesterday? Yeah, so let me see if I go. Only if it's easy for you. If if not, no worries. Open recent, maybe. That's stock pictures that we're going to look at yesterday. That's my day two inspiration. Um, So let's see here. Yeah. Does that make more sense now? Yeah, that's awesome to see. It's, it really makes a huge difference. And this process, as we went through yesterday with, um, let me see, I gotta go up with this picture as well. It wasn't about just photographing him on the white. We built the dock, we built the texture of the ground. For this lady right here, I photographed her on the dark background, but then I built a red canvas, knowing that this red canvas would spill red light onto the talent. She was actually leaning, she was holding onto a rope, she was leaning against a red piece of canvas. So when I composited these pieces together, it was really about blending textures rather than cutting her out against green. So I wow. always use these tools of match to source to help me in the composite process. How long would you say, I know this is kind of a loaded question that no one can ever answer, but how long would you say each final image takes you? Is it a matter of a few days, a few weeks, a few months? I don't think I have the patience to work on something for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have commercially, sometimes yeah. I work on pictures for a long, long time. Um, it so depends on the picture. Some okay. pictures are easy. Other pictures are really hard. And sometimes I don't measure and prepare as well as I should. And it takes me longer to massage the pictures, you know, to, to fit together. Um, I don't know, two, three days, maybe. Okay. I mean, if I were to sit with it in one session, maybe it's a day and a half, but it never works that way. Right. So and are your time, of course. Yeah. Are your timelines for commercial projects, pretty quick turnaround times, or do you kind of, um, have it have like a spread out amount of time to do the shooting and the compositing? Uh, it's pretty spread out. And you know, the retouch time is maybe just half of it. So we do things in stages, right? So they do the initial pass at it, which is often just me doing what we'll do next. <clears throat> and then it goes for a review and then they have feedback. And the first few rounds probably go between me and the advertising agency only. Then it gets to my retoucher to fine tune and work on the feedback and implement whatever the agency wants. Then it goes back to the agency again. And then they often present to the client. 
and this can take time. Right. So, you know, in a corporate environment, people are busy, you know, to sit down and really pay attention to these things takes, I find in the post process for us, the time given to clients to give feedback and approve is longer. It's a bigger part of the process than for us to actually do the work. So, yeah. and I think everyone would probably second that. Definitely. Unless it's something that's where we have creative freedom to just deliver what you want. But that never happens. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. True. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, it, it wasn't a question from the chat, but I'm sure people were interested in hearing a little bit of your insight into your, your process in that way. I often get that question, you know, how long does it take? Um, I'm sure I get that as well. <laughs> so I'll tell you this. So we have now about an hour and a half. Um, and as I mentioned, I thought I would do this picture from scratch so that I could talk you through my thinking when I do a photograph. Um, I realized yesterday that was probably not such a great idea. I have to be better prepared. So I have prepared some, but I'll take you through the process. And then I think what I also mentioned yesterday, you know, putting a picture together so it looks good, take 10% of the time to do the fine tune of the masking, to mask here, to make sure that everything is seamless picture, uh, pixel by pixel. That takes the other 90%. So I think we can get in the next hour and a half to a place where the picture feels pretty good and you get to know my process. And then it's a different tutorial if you want to fine tune your masking process, right? I'm sure that you can find great. that out there too. Definitely. Um, so the creative process. So should I talk about this for a second? Sure. Let me see if I, maybe while we talk, should I see if I could um, pull up? Let me just pull up this one. This is part of what I explored yesterday. So we have something to look at instead of me just talking. Um, so when I was asked to do a picture, right, I thought, oh, it would be fun to do something new. And then I thought, what would I do? And my daughter says, I got two daughters, but I refer to the one that's older of the two, which is four. Uh, she has great ideas and she come up with the most funny things. And she said, oh, look at this. The moon is so close to the stars. You could just take a step between them. And I thought, oh my God, that's an amazing picture. What if you could do that? You know, what if you could take that step? And I thought, what would that look like? I had um, just finished this advertising campaign where I had this lady in the bubble flying from the moon into a starry night kind of thing. I don't know if you remember it, but that's pretty recent. And I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't just repeat myself for this one. But I still was fascinated of her being in the sky. And then I thought, oh, hot air balloons. So we see those quite often from our house. And every time my daughter goes, oh, hot air balloons. So I photographed a whole um, shoot with these hot air balloons for a client a couple of years back. So I thought, okay, I have the balloons. So I'll pick one and I add my daughter to it and we'll put that into a landscape. So that's my thinking from it. Um, there's a Chuck Close. We know, all know who Chuck Close is. Yeah, he has this extraordinary quote. I wonder if I should, I pulled it up yesterday when I was prepping for this talk, but I am paraphrasing here. He says that most people sit around waiting to be inspired. Um, now, this is what he says. Inspiration is for amateurs. Most people sit around waiting to be inspired, but the rest of us, we go to work and through the work, we will be inspired and inspiration will reveal itself in the work that we do. Something yes. like that. So yeah. the idea is that you don't sit around to be um, be inspired and then <laughs> go and do something. You actually just start doing something. And through that, it will be a process. And that's partly what I explained, right? I had the pressure of creating something for you. That gets me thinking. And it goes from one quote my daughter has to I don't want to repeat myself, don't want to do another you know, thing with the sky and the moon to, oh, well, flying balloons, and here we are. Um, yesterday, and also partly before, I talked about matching to the background, right? And it's what I call the unmovable element. And usually that is the background, because it's not easy to 
when I do composite photography, it's easier to work from the background forward because I could turn a person around or turn a car around or whatever I want to composite, right? I could walk around it, but you can't walk around the landscape. So to shift the light on the landscape to match something different, it's not as easy. Mm. So, but in this case, we kind of have to in that I have the balloons. So the balloons are my unmovable part, which will now set perspective and light. So I photographed my daughter to fit the perspective and light of the balloon. And then I started exploring some backgrounds um, that I had. This is from New Zealand. Um, I tried different things with the balloon going higher and lower. I realized I didn't see my daughter. So I wanted to be closer up. So we're going to do something closer. Um, so this is just an exploration I did yesterday to get to where we are now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions? Uh, no questions right now. Just people uh, enjoying what you're doing. Am I talking too much? I'm not retouching it. Not enough. at all. No, this, <laughs> it's so insightful. <laughs> okay. So let me see. Uh, this is day two for us. Um, should I open Lightroom like I did yesterday or should we just pass on that? I think let's dive right into Photoshop. So we have a little bit more time on the compositing end. Yeah. Um, I'll just show you real quick because I did some process, some files. So yesterday I opened up all the original parts and pieces so that people could see um, all the raw files, but we're not going to do that today then. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here so you guys could see. This is some of the frames that I liked um, from the prior shoot that I did with the balloons. Um, it's kind of fun. I, um, it's a lot of great pictures in this. Sorry, I should be this little braggy, <laughs> but it was a lot of pictures <laughs> that I, I never caught the first time around, you know, when I shot this maybe two, three years ago. Um, all the pictures that I'm using, by the way, is at a license for the client. That's what I'm working on older files so that there's no issues with licensing and mm. all that stuff. So that's why I'm working on older work and not something that's super, super new. Um, so I started with some of these further away things. I like the shape of the balloon. I Googled vintage balloons and got all these posters that really inspired me yesterday. Um, but it was just too far away. I felt like I didn't see, I mean, you can see the talent in here, even though this is small on your screen. It's just, it's just an atmosphere picture. It's not a picture of anyone, right? There's no story there, but for the balloon in the air. So this is some of the pictures that I put into the landscape I just showed you here. So it's a higher perspective looking down into the basket. Um, we don't need to work on that anymore. So I scrapped those and decided for these where we're slightly lower and looking up at them. So this frame here is um, what we're gonna work with. I marked that in red. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then here's my daughter. Apple used to have, have this beautiful gallery view um, that they took away where you could see a preview of the pictures just big oh, at the top. Oh, yeah. I know. I miss that. I so miss that too. People thought it was useless, but for us photographers that want to glance at what we have in our folders, you know, that was yeah. pretty awesome. All right. So um, should I just open these? Or maybe sure. this is just fun for me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I realized after that was fun at the time when we took these pictures together was that, oh, I talked about, oh, let's be pirates and, you know, use our telescope and look at stuff. And she wanted to use the paper towel roll. I wanted to, I gave her this little metal piece that was smaller. Um, this paper I towel ended that. up covering her face a lot. So, oh, so yeah, cute. It's, it's, it's way bigger. Um, this is kind of besides, you know, that's fun. Um, what we're going to speak to when it comes to retouching today. But for a kid, and it goes for grown-ups too. And I, I said, oh, let's take some pictures. She would just stand there. She would lift her desk and she would say cheese and do sort of these classic things of family photos. But as soon as I said, hey, um, let's pretend something, things start to happen, right? It looks way more engaging. 
yeah. when she is imagining something going on. And I think for me, when I first started taking pictures, I'm, I'm rambling, Anna, but bear with me because this is quite important when you work yourself into being um, a solid photographer. <clears throat> I would always direct the people as in, this is the picture I want to take. So now you stand here and you look there. And think about that. It's a really awkward position to be in for someone, right? Get all self-conscious and this and that. And then maybe six, seven years ago when the 5D came out and every photographer became a videographer and you got asked, oh, let's shoot some video. And with that, I should have learned this sooner, um, but with that, I became acutely aware of setting the stage for a narrative to unfold in my frames rather than, oh, now you stand here and look at the light. So now, stiller motion, I would set up my frame and then I talk to the talent about what the story is, what the narrative is and who they are and who they're projecting and the emotions of it. And I say, this is kind of your spot in the, in the frame, but don't worry too much about it. The key light is over here. So you will look best if you're facing this way. But from there, be the character, be the person, have fun with it. And it changes everything in the frame. So if you want to create engaging pictures, um, think story first and let the people that you photograph in on the story and um, it will really change everything. I love that. Um, so. Um, a question from the chat that I missed earlier. Sorry, Jan. Uh, Jan was wondering if you go back and rework any previous work, previous personal work. Yes and no. I've done a few times. Yeah. No. Well, so I, I, so imagine, I have done it a couple of times, but imagine in my career, right? That's now spending 20 years. I could maybe count those times on one hand that I felt compelled to go back and redo something. Right. We all like to expand and grow and try new things. If I messed up something old, I don't feel so inclined to go back and fix the old or rather grow from it and learn from it and keep pushing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so fun, right? I um, love these. They're so cute. So let me see. So I have my background. Well, not background. We're going to add something behind this, but I have the basket. And so this is a whole group of people and I don't have the basket by itself. So I'm not sure if I'm going to go too much in detail. We'll see how much time I have, but I'm going to remove these, right? And put my daughter in there. Then I did um, get a few stock pictures. Um, courtesy of Adobe Stock, who gave us quite a few credits to, to play with for this. So we're going to add replace. Maybe it would be fun with a paper towel roll, but we're going to try to replace <laughs> it with a telescope. And uh, that's kind of fun, isn't it? Okay, let's use that one. Yeah. I think I masked one, but she looks kind of engaging there. I really like that. That's one profile that I looked at, but Okay, so let's just get rid of all these. Hmm, fun. Um, all right. I, let me see. Is it helpful if I show you kind of where I landed yesterday when I started prepping this? Sure, yeah. Just so you get an idea of where this is going. It's by no means kind of done or finished or, but oh, this wow. is kind of where we're heading today. Yeah. In the next hour, I hope we'll, um, I got some camels. If you have time, maybe we add a caravan <laughs> down here. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where it takes us. So yeah, I started this eight o'clock last night thinking, oh, you know, dinner's over. I'll just explore a little bit. And I realized that, oh my gosh, <laughs> I gotta be a little <laughs> bit better prepared. I think it would be fun, right? But this would be a 24 hour thing if I really were to explore this from scratch with everyone. Yeah. So let's just dive in. Um, first thing we do is to create masks for the pieces and, and throw it in there. Again, my unmovable part today, the thing that we're matching to is this. A super hazy day, right? fog so it's backlit you can see that by the shadows of the trees and all that but it's so subtle because it the sun is coming uh, mm. through the fog that morning so it's a little highlight in the back to the right 
Um, so that's it. And it's my daughter. Um, she got a straight highlight, so she could work probably both ways, maybe a little bit more highlights on this side. But this is so easy to shape, to fit into this. So essentially, I just put her in the shadow of the house with the sun right back um, to drop her in. So here we go. Um, masking process is the same as yesterday. I'm just going to get rid of some real estate. So that's what we're working with. We click our layer mask button. And again, a million ways to mask things in, in Photoshop, but I'll start with a magic wand and just do a quick, there we go. Doesn't work so good on the trees, but that's okay. There we go. I'll feather this. Um, I talked about this again yesterday, so I'm not gonna repeat it too much, but there's, when you use this tool, especially, you could set the feather, well, not on this one, but for a lot of the other tools, you could set the feathering as you select, but for this one, you um, feather afterwards. And there has to be always a tiny bit of feathering because organic matter like people are never really pixel by pixel. So then we have a decent mask to start, and then we're just gonna fine tune this quickly. I hold down the shift key, it will give me a plus sign on my lasso tool, and I'm just gonna draw this in. So there's many layers to my masking process, right? I never mask properly to begin with, because I know that my pieces are gonna shift and move. And in the end, right, when I'm sort of done, it becomes more of a blending into the background um, as it is a pure masking. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm asking you, Anna, but I'm kind of asking everyone. Yeah. So. Let us know if that makes sense and you guys are uh, all feeling good about what Eric is doing here. Uh, and it looks like Jan said that Apple may have brought back the gallery view in the Mojave version. Um, it says, he says, keyboard shortcut is uh, control or command plus four. What? Now I'm very curious to know. I'm me work. too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. You are my hero. <laughs> Command four. Should I try it right now? No, I'm not gonna get distracted. I'm gonna stay the course right here. Um, I actually have my server computer. Um, I refuse to update because of this feature because it helps me find my thing so much faster. So it's still running and super old version. Okay. Um, so there we are. I'll do it a little bit better. Uh, if I hold on the option key for the lasso tool, it will give me anchor points. It's sort of similar to a path situation without having to pull the edges. So this works faster for me when I work with, um, if I work with cars or buildings or something, I use paths, but then I go fast on my initial paths. Um, this is how I do it. Mm -hmm. you know, this is probably the most boring part. So if, <laughs> if you think this is fine, Anna, and you want me to move along, just let me know. I think masking can... things is just. I mean, if you do boring. just like a quick little cleanup, then we can, um, move along. We have a few questions wondering um, uh, if you use a, if you would use the pen tool for that, and also um, why not use select subject? Uh, is that are you just doing this based on you know what you usually do? Yes, it's okay. really work habits, right? So the pen tool, yes. So if I were to do oh, always for cars that has like a beautiful gradient that moves like in a half moon shape. That's the pen tool, because then you could pull it and tweak it so that it has a perfect gradient that I can't really draw when I do this, right? Right. But otherwise, I feel like pulling the anchor points and doing that stuff just slows me down. Um, I agree. Again, um, I did this, and it feels like long, but that was maybe a minute and a half or two minutes, yeah? And yeah. it's just masked out rough enough perfect. for us to get the party started. Um, here, first thing we do with anything, really, is to... Um, Get our layer mask going and then 
So let me see. We're going to deal with the whole background in a minute, but to start, I'm just going to get rid of the people in here. Um, so we could place my daughter in and then we'll worry about all the other stuff as we start putting it into a background. While Eric is working away here, just a reminder to everyone that Adobe Max is coming up and it's October 26th through the 28th and free for everyone to join and watch and learn a little bit of stuff and expand on some of the knowledge you've learned through Adobe Live and a little bit of what you're learning from Eric today. So definitely be sure to register for that at max.adobe.com. Is it going to be a live event this year? Uh, in New so York? It's, no, it's uh, all going to be virtual. So sad. It's the way things are going, isn't it? I know. I'm very excited for some in-person events, hopefully someday soon. <laughs> um, I've been going to... I don't know if I should, if that's a competitor or not, but I've been going to this photo festival doing workshops for, I don't know, seven, eight years. And it's just as much now for the social aspect and being with other photographers and having a week um, where I feel infused in the, in the industry, you know, and be learning rather than just being in my own bubble, you know, in my home office, sitting in front of the computer, retouching. Definitely. So it's important for photographers to be a part of the community, I think. Yeah. Okay. That's rough enough. So let's see what we have. Um, did I feather this? I did. Why don't I just do all of it for now? We'll keep the background. Oh, wait. I'll keep this. So um, since this was a, for a commercial shoot, you see we had an anchor to the ground. So when I took this picture, I'm in one balloon basket shooting across while we both had these mm. anchors to the ground so that we just didn't just take off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So again, there's so many ways to, to mask stuff in Photoshop. So yes, you could use the pen tool, you could use all kinds of, essentially the, the data behind it, right, is the same. So Photoshop computes uh, through color and light and all that stuff. So all the different tools use this similar algorithms to get to where you wanna be. So there we are. So knowing that I want to put someone in this basket, uh, let me get rid of one more thing here. Oh, that's actually a metal plate. I thought I missed the masking there, but it's actually supposed to be there. Um, this is obviously really crude, so don't judge me on this, okay? <laughs> it's just to, to move the picture along. And I think we're talking compositing and not really masking. Um, yeah. So we I definitely understand. Little, and see there's hands and there's people. Obviously, we just clone this stuff to take all that stuff away. Right. Um, so to back to where my daughter is, um, knowing that I'm going to put her into the basket, I would need two masks on this. One that puts her into the basket and one for her. So we'll create a folder and the folder we give it a separate mask. Okay. I'm going to call this... Okay, there she is. Awesome. So the mask on our folder is going to be the mask of the basket. So we're going to come in here. Now, by selecting this mask, I hold down the command key that will give me the mask of the basket. All right. So, and then I select this mask here, which is the mask of the folder my daughter's going to get into. And we're going to paint in the basket. 
like that. So now, if I'd done this correctly, um, she will not appear covering the basket. So let's just slide her in. There she is. And then uh, Command T, and we'll just size her down. I could have dragged her in as a smart object now that I look at it, but that didn't happen. So, and a smart object essentially just retains the information if you size up and down. All right. It's kind of fun, no? Yeah. I wonder, obviously this is the burner and all the stuff that makes it fly, but I think we're just going to take that away. Yeah, I think that would be good. All right. I like your work too, Anna. So anyone that follows my work, they should check you out. Oh, thank you. That's a huge compliment coming from you because oh, I, I feel like I, uh, I'm learning a lot about how to make my composites look more accurate in these past two days. <laughs> well, you got your style down at least. So yeah. You know. Okay. There she is. That looks so good. Yeah. I think that makes me excited. Okay. Me too. Um, I could have processed these, uh, or I would have, um, but I thought, you know, it would give us something to, to talk about and it, when it comes to matching. So in processing, I would have matched her to a warmer tone, knowing that she would go into something that was really golden. I would have given her a warmer color balance. But um, if everything was perfect, you wouldn't learn anything, right? So, <laughs> uh, let me see. I'm gonna give her some contrast there. Daniel asks, have you ever considered to use a drone to get images that might require a difficult point of view to obtain? Yes. I flown my drone uh, uh, quite a few times lately. And just was it last Friday? Ran it right into a power line. Oh, no. Yeah, crashed. Oh, was yeah. it OK? No, well, I think oh. it's okay. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't flown it yet. I have two drones, so this one I got new blades, so we'll to get it up in the air. But I was shooting for the winery, and there's one line that goes through the vineyard, and we were so far away, I didn't even know it was there, and we just took a dive. Wow! But yeah, what kind um, of drone do you have? So I have um, the Mavic and the what is the one before? Phantom. Okay. Yeah, so I have both those. Um, awesome. So you do use it commercially, then we hire a crew to do it, right? That gets the big mm. cameras up in the air. That so would be great. That would be different. Um, I got excited to show you. Can I show you something? Yeah. Not to be distracted, but let's <laughs> talk about different perspectives. And I don't think the client minds because this picture is going to be delivered on Tuesday and it's for a show in San Francisco. Oh, cool. Uh, so I could plug it, you know, here we go. Why is it not opening? So this background is shot, pretty much everything is shot with a drone. Very excited to see uh, Oh, Am I just, sorry. I just got excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to see it. I'm so sidetracked now. Here. Oh, wow. Oh my God, that's so cool. So it doesn't look like much, right? But for all these buildings, this is these buildings are shot completely separate. These two is one, these two, this is one, this is one, that one, because I have to stagger them down. And you can see for all these, I'm pretty much on the second floor. And here I am on the third floor. Mm. So even though it doesn't look like much, this whole sequence here is shot with the drone, but for the street and the talent. Wow. So. Wow, so awesome. And was the talent shot in a studio or um, in on location? Um, outdoor studio. And it's awesome. done on purpose, just like yesterday. You know, yeah. we talked about matching light sources. So I could shoot this in a studio and use studio lighting. But then I thought, you know what? The base is there. Let's go outside and we built the sweep outside. So that's so cool. This is my latest little drone project. I love it. That in, is anyway, awesome. so yes. Um, and in this case, I could probably have shot it with a drone. 
or maybe not. Maybe I could have crashed into the balloons, but this oh. was shot balloon to balloon to get this perspective. Um, so a couple of things um, when it comes to composites and that's shadows. If I were to be really anal and do this right, I would have put a board right here, right? And uh, that would have cast a shadow that would have been really organic onto her, right? As if she's close to the basket that will give you retractive mm -hmm. light. It's something to think of when you place objects next to each other that they are going to um, retract light or bounce light. So you got to figure out what that is. For us, this definitely is going to give us a little shadow right here on the bottom. So we're going to add that to ground her. Um, there we go. Should I go through again how I use curves for pretty much everything I do? Or um, is that... Yeah, I guess uh, let us know in the chat. Do you want Eric to show us how he uses curves or would you rather he moves on with the composite? So... We'll know in a few seconds. We're a bit delayed here. So um, I'll let you know what they say. So that adds a little bit of a shadow right at where she leans towards the um, towards the basket. Okay, there. So the three tools I use, um, curves for color, curves for contrast, and use saturation, and then I use color fill, which we touched on yesterday. Um, so Two things will happen here, right? The density of the basket feels heavy. And then I'm looking at her face that feels too dark. So I'm adding another curve. We're gonna fill this with black. And then we're gonna come in and we're gonna erase that mask just in her face to just mm. brighten this a little bit. Okay. So we're gonna do face density. I'm just gonna call this out real quick so we don't get lost contrast. Looks like uh, people are saying that they're very interested in learning more about curves and curves for color. All right. So we touched on it briefly yesterday. Um, so I found, find the curve tool to have infinite control almost to what you want to accomplish. So there's, you could use the uh, other adjustment layers, right? And you could add color balance or whatever whatever you want to choose to use. Um, but it does it with sliders. And then, as I said yesterday, the computer with um, the, do a computation that gives you the contrast and highlight and the contrast in the, in, the, in the shadows. Here, you could do it as you please by the top layer doing the highlights and the bottom anchor points um, doing the shadows. And then by adding anchor points, you could then adjust your contrast to be more or to be less. And it's almost infinite in the ways you can adjust it, um, even adjust your black points completely. So that's why I do this for contrast. Then the same happens in the color channels. So for red, we do want to make this warmer. Um, let's start with yellow because there's tons of yellow in this basket. And that takes us to the blue channel. And if you pull that down, we will add yellow. And now you see she's getting warmer already. Um, and it's the same thing. Instead of just adding more yellow with the slider, here we could add yellow just to the highlights by pulling this down. Yesterday we talked about me liking blue in the shadows, which I could pull this up. And that neutralizes some of the yellow by adding some coolness to the shadow areas by pulling this up. So it gives you infinite control, I feel, in how you see something um, come together in color. Yeah. Now, it's a little bit more tedious maybe <clears throat> at times, and it's not as easy as applying a filter pack or anything like that in Lightroom. But when you blend pieces in Photoshop uh, and compositing, I think it's important to have that control. So. Definitely. Um, um, and we have a, a question from Roy related to that. Um, you talked about density yesterday. How is that compared to contrast? Um, it's as simple as this. So let me see. Let's get out of this one. Um, 
it's, it's nothing really. So I usually start, when I do the architecture of my file, it's density on the bottom. Shadows usually comes first, but, um, and maybe underneath even. But density and contrast on the bottom, and then I do the colors on top. Mm. So, and then use saturation usually comes at the bottom too, so that I don't add colors and then use saturation on top. But we take away color and use saturation, and then we add other colors on top usually. So when I call it density here, it's really just because I want to make it a difference between curves and, um, and density. Because, okay, so I do the curve, now it's denser. Just as simple as up and down, mm. it brighter or darker. So that's my density layer. And I would often call that density. So when I go back to adjust anything, if I feel this piece is too light or too dark at some point, I know it's just this contrast or this layer rather than this. See, what happens is, and I did this early on a lot too, I would put a density layer in and say, okay, it's, it's too bright. And then I would, you know, an hour later, just, oh, no, it feels too bright again. So I would go and make a new one and I would make it darker, right? Now we have two layers pretty much equaling each other out, but they're really tweaking the pixels. So you will, if you do this a lot, you will get tons of banding and skies and this and that. So that's why I make sure to name my layers. So if I ever want to go and adjust the density of her again or the lightness or brightness, I find the layer that I named and I tone it back down instead of creating a new one on top. Mm. Yeah. That's super interesting. I had no idea that um, how you would layer your layers actually mattered in how the final image looks. You know, if, so you rarely see it in people and things with texture, but if you start doing a lot of these things to a cloud or a bare sky, especially, you'll start seeing the picture and the pixels falling apart with, um, in the grading, essentially, yeah. with banding. Um, so that's why I do this. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. Um, Someone in the right. chat is mentioning uh, a hidden auto correction, finding dark and light colors in the curves. Uh, is that something that you use or are aware of? Yeah. Um, so I used to use them quite a bit when I scanned film. Because mm. when you scan a piece of film um, or scan negatives, it comes back, you know, as the film emulsion, which is reddish, and you hit command I, to become bluish. And my go-to always was to autocorrect to see what that would do, because that would get me in the ballpark. Because um, there's so much grading and um, adjustments needed to get that negative back to sort of a place that's close. But now with the digital cameras and the way I shoot, I often set my look on location, right? So that's already captured and embedded in the file. So when I process it out, I'm so close that I'm not sure if I, I haven't used autocorrect in so long um, to get close to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to mm -hmm. the white balance that we got a question about yesterday. Right. I'm not really interested in what the computer does in setting a look or neutralizing color for me and gi giving me something that's data correct. Um, it's about feeling and emotion and tactileness and tone and color. And that doesn't come from uh, an auto button. That comes totally. from us setting it. Um, all right. So she feels a little green in here. So I could keep the density layer, I guess. So just take that down. Uh, this is nothing. And I think this this is color. So I'll warm that up. We'll add some red to her. Um, we're not going to go too much further in color correcting her because this is going to change when we add uh, the sky behind. So I kind of like this landscape, by the way. So in some yeah. ways I would have taken away the buildings and I could have added just a soft sort of ethereal cloud to it now that I look at it. And initially it was what I wanted to do, right? To sit down and just explore things and see if you could make something good. But um, time is running out. I'm just I know, away, yeah. Anna. So I'm going um, to make this bigger for you. I'm just going to dive into the um, the photograph that I was intending to make with these dunes from uh, Namibia. So I'm just going to close that out. I'll save it. Okay. So let's see. All right. 
one of the most extraordinary places I've been to is Namibia. right wow right oh my that's gosh. beautiful let's show you this it's my assistant with our cameras <laughs> um so if i were to do a normal composite right i would sit down with this and say <coughs> this image has this and this light quality it's soft from the back left and i would match everything to this picture but now we're starting with the balloon because the balloon is the hardest piece to get, right? So now we got to make sure that the picture we use matches one, the balloon, and two, my daughter that we shot in somewhat the same light as the balloon. And we're going to massage these pieces um, together. So I need something that is backlit, but it has a really, really soft quality to it. Um, close. Mm. That's so dreamy think? looking. I um, like that. Something about the lighting and the coloring there, it looks very surreal. So let's see. So I'll open a few and we can drag them in and, and see how it all fits. Obviously the hazier the light, the better it is for us. Something like this. And maybe this, these look awesome. Here's an interesting question for you from Weston. Uh, if you could go back to one place in the world to re-photograph, where would it be? Oh, wow. To re-photograph. <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. I think I'd like to explore Norway more. Mm, you know, That's on my I was, bucket list. I was there till I was 22. And now I spent just more than half my life here in the U.S., Wow. So as we looked at yesterday, my photographic DNA is partly from Norway. So I would have, that would probably be it. I have told my wife though that, so as a photographer, right? When we travel, I feel like I, when I seen a place, I don't really crave to go back there as much as seeing something new. Really? Yeah. Now this N Namibia, I found a piece there that, um, I haven't really, it was just so quieting, this open desert landscapes. And I stayed at a place called Volvadons. And I keep telling my wife that one day uh, I will take her back there. Um, so, well, I say take that her back really there. Nice. We weren't together at the time when I was there. So let me see. Mm. Um, all right. Okay, this one feels good too. So we're gonna drop a few of these behind and then we'll see how it feels. And um, so that's landscapes. And then I did pick a couple of uh, clouds already and we could maybe end up just using the cloud, but it would be fun to add another element to it. So. All right. <laughs> so pretty. I love those. It's one of these magical days. Let me see. We're not going to use this whole cloud, but just because it's part of the process for me to have all the the assets I want, we're going to, oh, 20, we're going to do this at 40, 15. Okay, so that's what we have to work with. I'm going to just, so those are, the, this is usually the process, right? Bring in all the elements and then um, we're just going to, for now, not, fully even retouch these just going to line them up roughly um because i don't know if you'll use all of it yet uh, 
So how do you get inspired, Anna? While I do this masking stuff, maybe you know, <laughs> for people that haven't seen yeah. your work, they should check it out. And then uh, I'm curious how you um, go about it. I get inspired a lot by um, kind of, I would say like spending time in nature and looking at things and just kind of my brain starts to work in a weird way where I'll be looking at something and seeing what I see with my eye. And then all of a sudden my imagination will start to like bloom out this whole thing in my head. And that's kind of where a lot of my ideas will come from. For example, um, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we were just in Iceland and I was looking at the mountains and I started to see like these shapes form in my head and see like body figures and all these ideas come to me. And, and then, um, always that moment right before I fall asleep is where I get a ton of my ideas. My mind just starts drifting. And most of the time I forget a lot of them in the morning, but sometimes I do manage to write them down and, and then, uh, start to work on them the next day. Oh, journaling is important, huh? I've, yes, it's interesting. I, I started journaling when I moved to the U S in 1995 and got journals all the way up until, um, until I became a dad. Wow. It's harder to find the time now. Well, it's not hard to find the time you prioritize, right? You'd rather be with the with family and kids then um this one is beautiful i think let's see if that fits oh yeah um, so let me mask out the bottom of this oh. so let me see when uh, so western culture right we read from left to right and it's interesting but a lot of my pictures follow the story or narrative from left to right in the frame um so now i see that emery is looking this way right which is backwards um and the light in this landscape is coming from the left while it's hidden on the right side of the balloon so two things will serve me here if I flop the balloon. One, the light will match. And two, we'll follow the flow from left to right. And she'll be keeping looking uh, in the same direction as we read. So we're going to quickly take these two parts, collect, um, select them together, hit Command-T, um, Control, bring up the drop-down menu, and we're going to just flip them horizontally there. So two things to this. We're looking down at the landscape in some ways or straight ahead at least so that this is our horizon line we're seeing the bottom of the basket right so the basket got to be above the horizon line as in something like this mm. kind of size so this comes back to um let me just retouch or mask this out when I showed you those pictures of my wife, Andrea, and how the camera sits high and low, you could cheat it on the person in some ways, but you could tell that when I was high, you saw the top of her shoulders. When I was low, we didn't see the top of the shoulders. And with the horizon line, it just looked a little off. And the same thing here, as we see underneath the basket, it has to be above our eye line, so above the horizon. You can just see that this is starting to look awkward really quick. So it's important to keep in mind. There we go. Um, you see, I get a line right here, as in one mask or one layer above is um, having a mask right here. So it affects the top and not the bottom. So we're going to go into this Emery folder. It's now in pass through. We're going to set that to normal. Oh, look at that. Mm. Wow, interesting. So. When this is on pass through, all the layers I have affecting my daughter is affecting everything underneath it, right? So usually we have this on normal, but look how dull this landscape looks now. Wow, yeah. So it's one of those mistakes you talked about yesterday when you sit there and do this stuff on your own. And this is a good argument for every photographer to do, if not their own retouching and at least their own exploration and how they want the picture to look. So photography, 
with the introduction of um, digital photography, um, we can't just let the computers decide how pictures should look, right? We have to infuse ourselves or having a retoucher do it. So I just got excited now because I realized that <laughs> the color here looks so much cooler than without it. So what we'll do, we'll come in here and we'll take, um, this is only for the shadow on our dress. We don't need that one, but we need well, the face density is also what's affecting it. So we're gonna take all these layers. I'm gonna name this for color. Since I like what it does, we're gonna copy these and we're gonna drag them underneath so that it affects our landscape. Now we have the color that we like there and we're gonna put this on normal so, so that now that I put future layers onto my daughter, it won't affect what's underneath it. It'll only mm. affect this one. All right, this is exciting. Yeah, it's coming okay. together. Uh, let's make it darker. All right, so let's see. Okay, so two things here. So we have a close up of the basket. We have a real close up of my daughter, and we have a wide, wide landscape. So now I'm sizing the landscape up to fit the dog, um, the rest of it, which is fine. A background like this could probably take it, but we also have a file now that's 205 um, megabytes. I don't know if you need that. So maybe to keep or preserve some of our pixels, maybe we'll just increase this a tiny bit like this. And we size down these a little bit to meet in the middle. Like that, maybe that's mm -hmm. our frame. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Um, so a question I often get is, um, have we now Mary the pixel look of pieces that's been rest up and down. Is that, is that interesting? Yeah. Um, so this has been with me for a long time, but it really, really helps even things out. So we go uh, layer new and let me see, we're going to set this to overlay and we're going to fill this with 50% gray. What this 50% gray button do is to fill in an opacity layer that you can add texture to. So essentially we're gonna get a gray layer that we're gonna add grain to with that. So it, it's a grain layer that's on top. So we don't have to add grain to the bottom piece, the top piece and all that stuff. So we call this for grain. So here's our gray. Why did it turn gray? Let me see. I didn't do something right there. No. It should have been preserve opacity or something, right? Uh, why does it? We have. Oh, there. Um, oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm just confused, oh, Dana. It just turned gray because there's <laughs> nothing underneath it. So this is the trick. Oh, right? When okay. it's on an overlay, it doesn't affect the, um, the actual pictures. So in here, mm. we go filter, we add some noise. We add, it depends on the picture, right? So let's, let me see, can I make this bigger? If, I'll zoom in afterwards. So okay. eight, that might be a little too much, but so now there's grain uh, or noise rather. Um, so then you're going to blur that noise to make it look more like rain. So you go Gaussian blur and we just add a tiny bit of a blur to it, maybe point. F so you, you're going to explore this. So, um, that's the gray overlay layer. That's the noise that we blurred that feels like a film grain. When you overlay that on your different pieces, so let me see, I just take it up to here, turn it on and off. Can you can you see that? It's, it's zoom good yeah. enough. 
So you see it takes on a texture oh, within yeah. the balloon. Yeah. Now all the layers underneath it, it's going to have this texture and it's going to even things out so that if there's a different sort of pixel resolution um, or a pixel sizing uh, in the different parts and pieces of the composite, they now kind of feel the same. So That's so interesting. Yeah, I love that. Um, well, it is time for the artist spotlight right now. So if you feel like you're at a good pausing point, we can jump over to that and then go back to finishing this up. Does that sound good, Eric? Yeah, that sounds perfect. I'm going to drag this cloud okay. in there while you bring in that. So I'll, um, I'll stop my share and pass that over to you. All right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. And give me one second here. Let me get my screen up and all right so we are doing the artist spotlight right now on uh Vic Vikram I hope I'm saying your name correctly uh if you have anyone that you know that you want to nominate for this artist spotlight uh send them over and uh congratulations Vikram for being our choice today your work is absolutely beautiful so we're just gonna take a look through and Eric feel free to look at everything with me and and comment your thoughts and and kind of uh give him some feedback here let's see I love this one this reminds me of a lot of the work that um, Paul Tranny does. Um, maybe this was from one of the Adobe Creative Challenges. This is really beautiful. That is beautiful. Let's see. Wow, lots of a big body of work here. I always love these pieces. I've seen this kind of look a number of times and like charging ourselves and it's just so accurate to our modern world and <laughs> everything we go through and do on a daily basis. Wow. It's really cool. Oh, wow. This is interesting. Kick the habit. That's a really cool composite. You can see all of the, uh, let's see if we can zoom in a little. Wow. 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 That's so well done. And, and it really looks like the skeleton is kind of becoming a part of the ashes here. Beautiful job on that. Let's see, I can, there we go. Vikram, let us know if you are here today in the chat as we're reviewing your work. Oh, this is cool. Always love a good glitch effect. This is really awesome. And as you may know from my work, always attracted to these kind of bright neon colors. <laughs> so cool. So many good things. Looks like you've been trying a little bit of advertising work here. Always great to try your hand at that. Some water splash. Some portraits, some insects, animals, lots of things happening here. I really like this one. This is super cool. Wow. Love that with some lava and the robot. Love the lighting in that and like the blue shadows that we talked about. So beautiful. What do you think, Eric? I am super impressed. It's, yeah. Uh, I think um, he, um, is he, I would really benefit from um, looking at what maybe editing their portfolio a little bit because what i see here is whiskey bottles i see flowers i see animals and then i see this really, really elaborate conceptual work so i would maybe take a look at what what do i really um, want to photograph you know and because what i see here is maybe two three different photographers or the same photographer with very different voices so maybe Definitely. to split it up in different categories and find what you're really really excited about for me i think he really excels in the composite work 
I mean, the piece with the cigarette and the head there is absolutely stunning. So I agree. In my career, if I were to give a little feedback, I feel like I have a few benchmark pictures, right? Where I come upon another layer of what I'd like to accomplish. <clears throat> and I base a lot of my next evolution or my next period of work on that picture that really resonated with me. So I would say, mm. which picture in this body of work that you have really speaks to you and maybe set out on the path um, of creating more of that kind of work. So that, you know, I think right next to these beautiful composite pieces, it's just a simple picture of a moon. Do we, are we getting inspired by a moon next to this, you know, apocalyptic right. futuristic piece not really so i would think there's an editing job there that would help you really stand out in a better way than when i first glanced at your pictures because there's some exceptional work in here it's just being surrounded by things that's not i think as impressive does that make sense definitely i i completely agree i think um narrowing down your portfolio here uh, would be really smart and to focus on these composites because they're so good. This one, this robot versus superhuman is beautiful. And with the cigarette, it's absolutely stunning. I think that's a great tip. Thank you, Eric. My pleasure. And thank you, Vikram, for sharing your portfolio with us today. It's been a pleasure reviewing. And as I mentioned before, if you want to nominate anyone for the Artist Spotlight, please do so in uh, the chat. I believe Cody Bear has given you all a link to do that. And uh, let's hop back over to you, Eric, so that we can finish up your composite. All right. Okay. All right. So let me see. I did two things. Um, I realized I had to speed it up a little bit. So as we were looking at um, the artist spotlight, I did two things, three. Let me see if I can just go back so I could just catch you up a little bit. Um, So, um, um, let me go back one here. This is where we ended. And as we shifted over, I added the sky, which I showed you earlier on that I explored yesterday. Um, I changed the architecture. We don't want the sky at the top. We'd like to have the sky at the very bottom of our layer stack. So I moved it, uh, let me see, to the bottom. Then I will take away the sky right here to make our sky appear. So I just used the magic wand as I'd done before. I feathered the edge, I filled it up and that um, gave us a sky behind. Now wow. we have a little bit of a discrepancy here in that we have a harder sun which matches here but does not match the shadows in our background. So if this is a good measure, right? When you're gonna set up light with clouds. This is fairly nondescript. We just know that the sun is coming from the left. So this we can, you know, it's not hard to do. Anywhere on the left with the sun highlight will fit this basket. Now, if I take a line here following the shadow, the direction of the shadow like this, I'm going to end up with the sun somewhere outside the canvas right here. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. just take a line of the shadow I don't want to draw it on here right now because then I will mess up my history, but just imagine the line going this way. So with that imaginary line, I just moved my sky over. So I pushed the sky to the left. I didn't think that was enough even. I ended up pushing it all the way to outside of frame. So now this highlight gets a little bit more diffused. It can be sitting right over here and it will match up on our light source. So this is what I mean when I talk about match the light source. We can't put the sun right here. It will not match the dunes with the shadow coming this way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay. 
Um, a question for you about um, when you don't know a step or you don't know what to do within Photoshop, where do you get your information from? I'm sure having done this for 20 years, you probably um, maybe aren't searching as much as some of us beginners maybe, but. Um, so I do it all the time, not so much in Photoshop because I know my way around, but for Premiere, which I use for editing uh, mm. videos, which I do more and more, I like to be involved in that process. I like to learn, I, you know, I, I'm on I Google videos all the time. There's tutorials on the most random things, right? So for me to do some of the compositing work that I do in stills um, in Premiere, I've done tons and tons of tutorials. So yeah. um, the way I've been cheating to get around that is to do some of the compositing that I've done for film. I do it in the timeline in Photoshop. And then I export mm. it and put it in Premiere because it's probably a silly way to do it. But I know Photoshop. It just yeah. it's so native for me. Anyway, um, so we only have a few more minutes. For me, let me just make this a little bigger. I'm gonna, the yellow is really turning me off. I feel this picture is so monochromatic now in the brown tones, but for the yellow in the basket. But that feels too high. I don't think I'm going to do this right now because this is a simple color uh, move. But I would probably take all this yellow and turn it into this warm red. Mm. That, that way, this has more of a leathery quality to me. This feels just like a standout. It takes attention away from my daughter. So this is what I've been looking at. That's a flaw to me. I, I love monochromatic colors so that it's really massages together. So yellow, we're gonna deal with it later. My daughter is a little too blue. The basket feels a little green. So let's just start with the basket to get it into the tone of the landscape that we now established. And when you have the light set right in the perspective set to massage pieces together to make the composite feel right is color and contrast. Um, I don't use it as much, but if I'm lost here and there, I would just turn the picture. Let me see. I'm just going to do, I turn the picture black and white. Mm. And then you can start seeing that, hey, this basket actually feels a little too contrasty, doesn't it? Compared to some of the, there's no other blacks like that in the scene. It is closer to the camera. So maybe that will give it some more contrast. The further away, the hazier things get and it's less contrast. But for me, using this simple exercise here, it let me know that maybe we do a little less contrast and for sure a little less green in the basket. So let me select that again. We, we haven't done really any color correction to our balloon. So we're gonna add a curve layer. We're gonna make sure that that is uh, connected to the basket only come down to our red channel, make it a little warmer. Um, and then the contrast. So I'm gonna do this color. I'm gonna do another layer. The contrast could probably go overall. So I'm not gonna make a mask for the basket. So we're gonna do a little less contrast, which will be an opposite S, S curve by lifting the shadow area and toning down the highlight area. All right, then we're gonna do my little trick from yesterday to even out all tones, we go to solid color. This color palette sits in the warmer reds, maybe even a little purplish. Let me try this mm -hmm. first. And we tone it down a bit there maybe. Okay, take it to color. And we go all the way down on the luminosity. There, feels pretty good, no? Yeah. And I realized that, you know, maybe the, I lost some contrast, right? Because I took it down here to match, but maybe I just need more contrast on the bottom instead. Mm. So we come down here and we're going to give our background a little bit more contrast there. Yeah. And then we're going to increase the contrast again in the basket there. What time do we have, Anna? Let me see. Uh, you have a little less than 15 minutes. Okay. So same process for my daughter. So when you reduce the size from what I had, which is a 45 megapixel, you know, Canon file, um, 
she obviously lost some contrast here. So we got to freshen her up. When you resize pictures, you have to um, do some sharpening afterwards. So filter, uh, sharpen, sharpen, unsharp mask. All right, that helps. Yeah. And maybe I went a little too heavy on my grains. So see that? Oh yeah. I would probably in this case, I did eight and 0.4 for this picture then, which is that crisp. I would probably go back and do it at five points of grain and blur it 0.3 because now it feels. Actually for the picture, this film grainy look, it, it kind of kind of makes it nice. Yeah. Okay. So let me see. You're going to come in here, solid color. I think that's a good place to start. I think you're going to go more orangey for her. Attach it. Color. Take down the opacity. All right. Feels maybe a little orangey. So you're going to come make it a little bit too red. Just a tiny bit there. Cool. That helps a lot. And do a little <clears throat> more contrast, maybe. Okay. So what I often do with hair like this, instead of trying to mask it, I often blend it. So I could I do that in different ways. Sometimes I actually just copy it out, and I um, do an I copy the hair, and then I do a multiply layer on the hair. So just to quickly show you, I would do it on a separate layer, but if I do multiply, nothing happened. Why? Yeah, that's right. Because I did it on the mask. Let me see there. Ah. Nothing happened. Maybe I'll do there. So if I were to copy the hair, you see how that instantly sort of blends it into the background? Yeah. Do I, have, I might not have time to do it, but that's how, that's one way to do it. I would just copy one frame of the hair like this. Um, I would copy, I would paste it in place, which is command shift paste. Uh, and then we would put it underneath there. I'm kind of doing it. I just started. Yeah, that's fine. You have a little bit of time. And then Everyone's always intrigued by hair. Yeah, and then we multiply it. And that way, there's no masking. It sits naturally in there, right? Yeah. Um, so then, um, let me see. If I come in here and I mask my daughter. Her hair then, her hair edges sits organically in there. So this need to be obviously warmer to match. So I'm just do a quick there. Mm. And now sort of put her hair in there. Yeah. Such a great pro tip. I like that. A pro tip. Yeah. And it's so much faster <laughs> than to sit there, right? Because if you were to do this by hand, one masking is terrible. And then you'd probably just paintbrush in some hair to sort of give you the edges. But this way, it's all organic. It's in there and it's done. Yeah. And um, would you say that this is an acceptable way to do it for your client work too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this okay, is, that's... it becomes seamless. Another yeah, thing that I so do quite a bit is to uh, do this on the shoulder here. Um, maybe I'll just use a brush, get out of that. Mm. D. So I'm just gonna paint some of these areas here. So one other thing I look at quite a bit is matching highlights. So when my daughter's highlights are bright, bright, bright like this, and the background does not have a single white highlight, you got to give these highlights the same tone as the rest of the picture. If not, it's just going to look off. Not a single white highlight in all of this, but for the light we have on my daughter. So that gives it away right away that this comes from another piece, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I went into the quick mask, I painted in, but now when I get out of this, it'll become a selection. 
Command Shift I for inverting that selection. And now I can come in here and do curves again and pull down my highlight lever, all right? So I'm pulling down overall to just give it density. And then I know the clouds are warm and um, yellowish. So we just go into the yellow highlight, pull that down into the green and we're gonna pull down magenta. And now we have sort of massaged those highlights in there and already she feel a lot better. Yeah, so much better. Um, she, she feels awfully, sorry, I was swatting flies. <laughs> <laughs> um, she feels awfully small here to me. We still have an 180, 1.4 gig file and 183 uh, megabyte flat file. So we, I would probably zoom in on this, right? So that the narrative is right in here rather than way out here. Okay, I got a few more minutes. The last thing to this, it's going a little too fast. I would like to have a little bit more time, but this is not <laughs> fun with toilet paper, right? So let me see. I did get my stock pictures yesterday, day two. Where did the... Uh, As we wrap up here, I just want to remind everyone in the chat to stick around for the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge, and that will be coming up after this. And if you missed Eric yesterday, be sure to watch the replay, and you can also watch the replay from today as well. He talked about a ton of incredible information and knowledge for anyone interested in learning all things Photoshop, so be sure to check that out from day one and day two. Let me see. I didn't move them out of my download folder. Uh, oh, there's fine. Right. Okay. This might not be the right one, but just for the illustrator purposes, right? Um, we'll try this. So it doesn't look like it would fit at all, but let's see what happens when we put it. Let me see, let's just undo that tab, drag layer. I'm gonna get out of my daughter's folder to start. Let me drag it in. Okay. There. Oh yeah. It's amazing how it starts to kind of look like it might fit just by changing the angle. So when I looked for pieces, the most important part for me was that light quality was okay, as in flat enough. And then that it was pointing the same direction as my daughter was looking. So it's still maybe not quite perfect, right? Um, so let me see. The toilet paper roll was also way too big. So I'm just going to snap off that piece. Mm. Might not be the right one here, I know. That's okay. We only have a couple minutes left. Unfortunately, I'm so sad. I want to watch your tutorials all day. And do you have any other, do you have tutorials online that we can continue watching? So I do have a couple. Um, so you can just go to my website or just search Eric Almas tutorials and you'll you'll Great. find a couple. Yes, and I know Cody Bear put that into the chat. So check out more of Eric's tutorials on his website if you want to learn more from him. I'm so sorry to end this today, Eric. This has been incredible, very insightful. Thank you everyone for joining us in the chat. Thank you, Eric. I had a pleasure learning from you. It was awesome to get to know you and get to learn a bit more about your process. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks for being a, a super good partner and host in this. So appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Have a great one, everyone. And we will see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Cheers.